Okay, well, what do you say we pray and let's dive into the book of Colossians? Amen? Join me in prayer. Father, we love you. We thank you, God, for the opportunity to gather together, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, that you're already here in our midst, moving, Lord. Your word, God, we thank you that you've sent it to heal our diseases. We thank you that you sent it to be that lamp to our feet, that light to our path. And Lord, may it be stored up in our heart this morning, God, as we look to it. Precious Holy Spirit, have your way. Have your way. Lord, encourage, convict. Do, Lord, what only you can do in our lives. But Lord, we just give you access to every part. So thank you, Lord. Give us ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church in Jesus' name. And all the church says, amen. Amen. Now, for those of you that are just joining us, we are on a series called Unhindered, where we've been going through the book of Colossians, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. And this series is all about removing the barriers that hinder our spiritual growth with Christ. We've explored several important topics like forgiveness, surrender. Last week, we talked about the assurance of salvation. But today, I want us to pick back up where we left off and read Colossians 124, where Paul addresses a crucial aspect of our Christian journey, suffering for the cause of Christ. So let's read this together. It says, now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. And in my flesh, I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's affliction for the sake of his body, that is, the church. Now, it's important to remember all that Paul has already said to the Colossians. Each point is building upon a foundation. And in this verse, he introduces us to the idea of rejoicing in suffering. Now, that phrase may seem contradictory at first, right? Because why would anyone want to rejoice in suffering? Well, let's just talk about what that means. Because suffering in the context of faith, it's not about seeking pain or hardship, but it's about being willing to endure challenges and difficulties for the greater purpose of us advancing the gospel and strengthening the body of believers. It's about recognizing that, like Paul, we're all part of a grander narrative, a story of redemption and transformation and hope. Now, what's that mean, practically speaking? It means that as followers of Christ, we understand that our faith, it's not always going to be smooth or pain-free. It's recognizing that the trials and the challenges, they're an inevitable part of our walk with the Lord. But that doesn't mean that we seek out pain. That would be a masochist, right? No, it's about us having the right perspective whenever these difficulties come our way. How many of you know that life's experiences aren't solely defined by the events themselves? but rather by the perspective from which we view them. See, whenever we face suffering for the cause of Christ, we can find purpose and meaning in our trials because it causes us to shift our focus from temporary discomfort to the eternal impact. And Paul says it this way in Romans 8, 18. Many of you will be familiar with it. He says, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory which is going to be revealed to us. Now, how does that hit home, practically speaking? Well, if you work at a job where you see some of your coworkers and others uh, cutting corners or practicing unethical uh, business practices, yet you choose to do what's right, see, that could cause you to encounter some opposition face career setbacks, or even risk job security. This can be a form of suffering in that you are standing up for truth, even when it may cost you something. You know, it reminds me of uh, something that I heard many years ago, a story that I heard about a warehouse worker, uh, Will, 
who had refused to join in uh, with his co-workers who were stealing products, and then they were covering it up by cheating on all of the inventory sheets. Will's refusal to be a part of what they were doing caused them to get jealous and then go and to lie to his boss about Will, resulting into his wrongful termination. But as the boss continued to consider Will's character, he knew that something wasn't right, and so he did his own investigation, and he found out what really happened. And when he found out what had really happened, he fired the entire crew. Then he went back to Will, apologized to him, and offered him a promotion and a raise. Now, I've always loved that story because the boss, or in our case, God himself, he recognizes your integrity and your willingness to endure hardships for standing up for what is right. And he sees your commitment to the eternal values of of truth and integrity, which are far more valuable than some product or gaining temporary success. I guess what I'm saying is this. Our actions have eternal significance. I encourage you to write that down. Our actions have eternal significance. But it isn't just in the big things like what we just talked about here. But it's also just as important in the small things. How many of you know that small things, they are really big things to God? Did you know that? Hey, if you don't believe that, then go read the story about the widow's mind. Hello? If you don't believe that, then go read about the little boy with the five uh, loaves and two fish. You see, even the smallest acts of obedience and devotion, they matter to God. See, we think the phrase suffering for Christ is only referring to those who are on the mission field or that are suffering persecution. And certainly that is suffering for Christ and a form of suffering for Christ. However, suffering for Christ can happen anytime we take a stand for what is right, what is true, and what is noble. It's the determination that even though everyone else may veer to the left or to the right, we're staying on the path of righteousness. Now, I mentioned the workplace there just a second ago, but you know this is also true of our marriages. Like, for example, the world, the world treats marriage like it's a vehicle that you lease for seven years and then you go and trade it in for a better one, right? But the follower of Jesus makes a lifelong commitment. We're not to be those who retreat in the face of challenges, nor do we walk away whenever we're up against a conflict, but we endure the hardships of, if I can just say it this way, seeking counsel, uh, working through our differences, and then putting in the effort of strengthening the relationship. And in so doing, what we end up finding is that we find a deeper love, and understanding, but then we also get to then serve as an example of perseverance and commitment to our children and to those around us. Speaking of our children, what we're talking about right here applies to parenting also. Anyone who has kids already knows that there's a lot of suffering that comes with parenting, right? Oh, everyone says, oh, me. (laughs) Like, listen, I have a 13-year-old a 16-year-old, and a 19-year-old, and I really do have good kids, but there's nothing easy about it. They, just like us whenever we were young, our kids go through times of rebellion and disobedience, and this can be a challenge for us as parents. It can be a challenge in our communication, a challenge in knowing how to best discipline them, a challenge in knowing how to best love them because they all need love in different ways because they're all different. But as parents, we choose to endure these trials with patience and love in order that our light would shine bright to them like the follower of Jesus that we're supposed to be. Amen? Moms and dads, this is why we have to make sure that we are whole, that we are healed. Are you with me? Because what's not healed gets handed down. So we make sure that we receive the healing that we need. But then we choose the temporary discomfort of addressing the challenges of parenting in order that one day 
we would see our children walking with strong values and character. So when Paul said, you know, way back in Colossians 1.24, uh, I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, hopefully now you've got a better understanding of what that means. It's not about us rejoicing in the sufferings itself. It's rejoicing in what the sufferings produce. For example, we don't rejoice in the fact that Jesus was tortured, beaten, and killed. We rejoice in the truth of what his death produced. And what did his death produce? His death produced redemption and salvation for humanity. And it opened the door for us to have a personal relationship with God to where we could experience his grace and be a part of his, his eternal kingdom. Hallelujah, somebody. And the same is true for what suffering does in us. Because anytime we face challenges, opposition, or even persecution for the sake of righteousness, we can rejoice, not in the suffering itself, but in the transformative power that it can have. How? Well, suffering can refine our character. It can strengthen our faith. It can deepen our dependence upon God. It can lead to greater perseverance, empathy, and compassion for others who are going through difficult times. I'll never forget whenever we were over in the other theater, and I was walking through everything that I was walking through. And some of you are here that are new, you don't know, but I had to go through brain surgery last year, and there was a point in my life where I couldn't even have an intelligent conversation with someone. And I remember the anxiety hitting me so hard that Sunday that I was ready to throw in the towel, y'all. Is it okay just to be honest? I mean, that because I couldn't even talk to someone. I thought, how could I be a parent? How could I be a, a pastor? How could I be anything? And I remember sitting there with this anxiety hitting me, and my wife came to me. Thank God for godly spouses. Everybody should say amen to that, you know. And she came over, and she leaned into me. She says, you know what you're feeling right now? I said, yeah. She says, some people live with that every day of their life. And I knew what she meant by that. She says, the Lord's wanting to show you something here. I didn't forget that lesson, babe. So, you know, when we go through these times of difficulty, And we don't throw in the towel. Thank God I didn't throw in the towel. You know, I just love this. This was so prophetic. Chris, you were singing a song um, that day. um, Hell lost another one. I am free. I am free. And man, I just started bawling. Y'all didn't know all this was going on. I'm sitting up here on the front row just a mess because I knew the enemy. And watch this. Here's what the enemy wants to do. He wants to try to take you out. Whenever opposition comes your way. But can I just give a word of encouragement? This isn't in my notes, but just listen. There's some of you right now, you are facing resistance. But understand this, that the resistance is the greatest right before the breakthrough. Don't give up. Don't be like Joshua and stop. Well, Joshua didn't stop. But don't be like, you know, the story of Joshua and stop on day six. Because day seven is the day of breakthrough. But we've got to endure. We've got to trust that God is going to see us through and that there is a great purpose through everything that we do. Just like Jesus' suffering led to the salvation of many, our willingness to endure hardship for the sake of Christ can and does impact the lives of those around us. Think about it this way, if I can just tie these two together. Think about it even in the context of our heart for the house. Like the sacrifices that we make, The commitments that we fulfill and the challenges that we'll all face together, they're not about the suffering, but about what it will produce, which will be a permanent place where people can encounter God, grow in faith, and and experience transformation. Amen? I guess what I'm trying to say is that every form of suffering that we endure as followers of Christ carries with it a purpose far beyond what we can see in that moment. And maybe that's why Paul tells us to rejoice in our sufferings. And not only did Paul say this, but by the way, Peter, James, John, even Jesus himself spoke to this very thing. Peter said in 1 Peter 4, 12, rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. 
James said in James 1, 2, and 4, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work. Don't cut the work short. Don't walk off on the job. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. John in Revelation 21.4, he speaks of the ultimate end of suffering for those who believe when he said that God, that Jesus would wipe every tear from our eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. And then, of course, Jesus himself in Matthew 5, 10, and 12 encouraged his followers to find purpose in persecution. He said, blessed are you who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Listen to what it says, rejoice, there it is again, and be glad. Why? Because great is your reward in heaven. Church, every time you pray, it is worth it. Every time you serve, it's worth it. Every sacrifice that you make, whether it's giving of your time, your energy, or your resources, just know this, it is worth it. And if you're here this morning and you feel like that maybe you haven't seen evidence of it being worth it, well, hey, your sacrifice is compounding interest. It's compounding interest. You may not feel like that you've seen the dividend from what you have have given, but I can promise you that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. That's what Hebrews 11, 6 teaches us. Matter of fact, if you know your chapter, you know that Hebrews 11 is the faith chapter, and it starts out by talking about faith, right? But you've got to believe that all of this is true of God. You've got to believe it, church. And can I just tell you, it is, because God's word says it is. He's not a man that he should lie. You see, really what we're talking about here when you think about it, the suffering for Christ, it's really a matter of faith. It's not about you pulling up yourself by your bootstraps because you don't have the strength in and of yourself. But watch this. You do have the power of the Holy Spirit. And if you will trust God and take him at his word, he will prove himself over and over in your life. I want us to read the next verse in Colossians, Colossians 1.25. Paul goes on to say, of which I became a minister according to the, just highlight this, stewardship from God that was given to me to make the word of God fully known. You see what Paul's talking about right here? This is a stewardship issue. Are you with me? He said, I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you. So in other words, the suffering that Paul endured, it wasn't just for himself, but it was for others. Now, this right here is where my heart gets stirred, because whenever I consider this, I think about the fact that one day there will be people in heaven as a result of the sacrifices that we've made here on earth. Now, if you don't believe that, well, let me just tell you what Jesus said in Matthew 5, 16. He says, in the same way, let your light shine before men so that they may see your good deeds and do what? Glorify your Father who is in heaven. Matter of fact, Paul says in Romans 10, 14 and 15, he says, how then can they call on the one in whom they've not believed in? And how can they believe in the one in whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. How can they hear if there isn't someone? Someone who's willing to put in the work. You say, yeah, but pastor, that's your job. You're the one who is supposed to preach to them. No, actually, do you know what my job description is? It's right there in the Bible. It's in Ephesians. It's laid out. My job is to equip the saints 
for the work of the ministry. Now, my commission as a disciple, as a follower of Jesus, just like you, is to preach to every person that I have the opportunity to. See, I think the problem here is where we, we look at the word preach. We think that that's just what people do that, you know, have pulpit ministry, like our pastors or elders or, or missionaries. But can I just tell you, that's not really what that word means. The word preach, if you want to go look it up in the Greek, I'll tell you, it simply means to urge, to urge someone to accept, which we're all called to do. And here's the thing. There's a reason that it's called the work of the ministry and not the comfort of the ministry. Are you with me? Because there's some work that's required. And so again, I say to you, this is a stewardship issue. Church, you and I, we have been given the words of life. We can't just keep them to ourselves. Doing so would only prove that we're selfish. And church, I'm so passionate about this because what we're talking about here is souls. And I think that it is eternally worth it for us to step outside of our comfort zones, make ourselves available to others, and to engage in a meaningful conversation with someone about Jesus. And Fred, can I just tell you, I don't know, he may be here today. It's okay if you are. I hope you are. But... Um, there's opportunities everywhere, and the, ripe, and the harvest is ripe. I only share this with you as your leader and, an exam, and as an example. I almost didn't want to say it, but I had a guy try to sell me a roof the other day um, and, and, and a lot of other things, and there's someone in my front door, and I just happened to be in sermon prep mode, so maybe I was primed a little bit. <laughs> but you know what? What I did and what I said any of you in this room could have done. It wasn't, well, Pastor Chris, you know, you've got, no, 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 you could have done it. If you knew the Romans Road, which is five verses in, in Romans that everyone in this room could have memorized by this time next week, you could have said the exact same thing that I said, because that's basically what I said to them. I just threw in a little bit of testimony in, in the middle of those five Roman Road scriptures, and a guy gave his life to Jesus Christ right there on my front door. Yeah. Friends, the harvest is ripe. I know that we think that, oh, you know, the world's going to hell in a handbasket, and yeah, well, maybe it is, but guess what? God's moving on the earth. God's not silent. God is moving. He's doing a new thing. Now, are we going to sit back on the sidelines and watch? Because that's what we like to do. We just like to watch. Are we going to get in the game? Right. Like God's calling you to get in the game, to get off of the sidelines and to get in and to know that God wants to do great things in and through your life. And can I just let you in on the secret? Like I said, they're hungry. The world is hungry. They don't know what they're hungry for, but you and I know that it's Jesus. And we're now commissioned by a holy God to go and to preach the gospel and to urge people to turn to the living God. I'm going to leave you with a, a story. It's a true story. In the mid-19th century, there was a man named William and his wife, Catherine, who beautifully displayed what it is that we're talking about here today. William and Catherine lived in the east end of London, a place of immense poverty and despair. And this couple was deeply moved by what they witnessed, and they felt compassion to take action. They believed that they were called by God to reach out to the marginalized and the downtrodden. But as they stepped out in faith, they started to experience tremendous opposition and obstacles, which, by the way, I can promise you that any time you step out in faith and try to advance the kingdom of God, you will come against opposition. As a matter of fact, for those of you that right now you're just kind of trying to grow in your faith, if you just try to grow in your own personal faith, you're going to face opposition because the enemy does not want the kingdom of God advanced in any form or fashion. So William and Catherine, they not only had opposition from the world, but guess what? They also were rejected by traditional churches who were often, then they were ridiculed for their unconventional approaches, but nevertheless, they persevered. They were, if I can say it this way, unhindered. <laughs> they endured the suffering in the form of criticism and hardship. And in 1865, they began their mission in a tent in a slum area 
where they preached the gospel and they provided food and shelter to the destitute. Well, their efforts gradually gained support because they didn't throw in the towel. And the Salvation Army was officially founded in 1878. William and Catherine Booth's commitment to suffering for the cause of Christ led to the global organization that we now know today, which has changed countless lives by providing food, shelter, I don't know, employment services. They provide veteran services, Christmas assistance, rehabilitation services. I mean, the list goes on and on. Now, why am I telling you this? Because it all started with one man and one woman who were willing to sacrifice and suffer for the cause of Christ, who refused to give up and throw in the towel. Church, God honors perseverance. I said God honors perseverance. Listen to what Hebrews 10, 36 says. It says, you need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. Now, I want you to notice the the two things that the writer of Hebrews teaches us in regards to perseverance. It says that you are going to need perseverance in order to do the will of God. See, that tells me that I can't just go about life on cruise control. I've got to be intentional. I've got to be steadfast. I've got to be ready and alert to be on call at a second's notice. And whenever the tough gets going, we press on. We press on for the call of the prize of the upward call in God in Christ Jesus. We look through the lens of eternity, knowing that our temporary trials are just that, temporary. We keep our hearts pure by storing up and guarding his word in our hearts. We make sure that his praise is ever on our lips. Listen, I don't know about you, but I know this. For me, my bucket list is to do the will of God. That's my bucket list. That's what I'm living for. Church, it is to be his name and his renown. That is the desire of our heart. Because anything else that you choose to do in life is going to be second place at best. But I want you to also notice the second thing that the writer says in Hebrews 10.36. He said, you need to persevere so that when you've done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. I feel the need to let you know that there are many of God's promises that are conditional. Now, I like to call them if-then statements. In other words, God says, if you will do this, then I will do that. Now, that's not the case with every promise of God, I understand, but it certainly is with this one. Like when the scripture says, so that, there's an implication that once we've persevered and done the will of God, then we will receive what he has promised. And what's that promise? It's the assurance of God's faithfulness to reward and bless those who remain steadfast in their faith, even in the midst of trials and challenges. And I believe that this is exactly what Paul was talking about here in our text today, Colossians 1.25, when he said, I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God that was bestowed upon me. Here's where I want us to bring this to a close this morning. Would you stand with me, please? When Paul said, I was made a minister, that word in the Greek is often translated servant. And so this stewardship that Paul was talking about, again, it wasn't that which was relegated just for those who have pulpit duties. As a matter of fact, uh, next week you'll see that in verse 28, it says, we proclaim him. That means that everything that he mentioned prior to that applies to each and every one of us, we Now, I know that today's message probably sounds a lot like God's asking you to lay down your lives. So let me just be clear in case you misunderstand. That's exactly what God's asking. Luke 9, 23 and 24 says, If anyone would come after me, 
Oh, this burns in my heart because there's churches that's preaching a weak watered down gospel and people are going to stand before God one day and say, Lord, Lord, did we not do this? Did we not do that? Friends, we need disciples, true followers of Jesus, not just church attenders. Are you with me? People who are ready to be all in. Jesus says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, not just add me to his list of things that he's doing so he feels better about himself. He says, if anyone comes to me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. You say, Pastor, what's that mean? That means that you are to no longer live for just you. You are to live for someone bigger than you. It means that you die to self, but you choose to live for Christ. Here in a few minutes, we're going to celebrate the price that Jesus paid for our sin through communion. But before we do that, I just want to ask the question, who is here this morning? And you know that you're not walking with God you know that you're not in relationship with God. Listen, I've been a minister now for a long time. I've been a Christian for almost 30 years. I think a minister right around 25 years. I know how easy it is for people to put on their church and act like with everyone else. Oh, I'm, 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 a, good, I'm a good Christian. It's kind of like an oxymoron, <laughs> you know, if you think about it, a good Christian, you know. no. There's no such thing as a good, like, there's none of us good. We're just all in need of grace. Are you with me? We're all in need of grace. And so wherever you are this morning, whether you're the person that maybe someone invited to church today and you just showed up and, and you're hearing this message, listen, let me just add something else to this. God loves you. God loves you. What God has for you, it's not going to be a walk in the park. So I'm going to go ahead and just tell you that right now. But there's no greater thing to live for but than for the cause of Christ. Because watch this. Each and every one of us in this room is living for something. If I can say it this way, we're worshiping something. You say, I'm not worshiping. Sure you are. You're giving your time, your energy, your devotion to something. And whatever, where you can trace that bread come trails, and once you follow it back, Oftentimes, you can just look at your bank account, and it'll tell you if, you if you really want to know what it is. But it's going to lead to something that you're worshiping. Choose you this day who you're going to worship. Choose you this day who you're going to serve. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. What about you? What about you? If you're here this morning and you've not been serving Jesus, he's not been the Lord of your life. I heard someone say it this way one time. He's either to be Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. And when I first heard that, I thought, man, that's a little hard. But then I said, but it's also right. Because God will not allow his glory to be shared with another. Jesus, again, himself is the one who says, if anyone comes after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, then follow me. So if you want Jesus to be your Lord. And you're going to say no to the things of this world. That's what's called repentance. And you're going to make the turn and say, Jesus, my eyes are fixed on you. I want to live my life for you. Some amazing things will take place when you do that. Because whenever you say, yes, I've been living for the world. I want to turn to God. And you put your focus on the person of Jesus. The first thing that happens is that your sin is forgiven immediately. Hallelujah. That means every mistake that you have ever made in your entire life. The Bible says those sins get thrown into the sea of forgetfulness, never to be brought up again. Ever, ever, ever. You might try to bring them up in your own mind. The enemy may try to bring them up, but they get thrown into the sea of forgetfulness. So the first thing that happens is that you're, and I'll tell you, when you get that weight of sin off of your shoulder, oh boy, does that feel good. Come on, saints. I mean, hallelujah. You get what we call the peace of God that surpasses understanding. You got peace and you don't even understand why. But it also has another beautiful promise that I didn't talk about today, and that's the promise of eternity. Jesus says, no one comes to the Father but by me. 
He said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one goes to heaven. No one goes to the Father but through Jesus. Faith in Jesus is the only way you get to heaven, friends. Your good deeds will not get you into heaven. It doesn't matter. You cannot be good enough. The Bible teaches that our righteousness, that means our very best efforts, they are as filthy rags to God. That is why Jesus needed to come to pay the price for our sin to be forgiven. He paid that price. If you want to receive that free gift, and it is a free gift, you don't have to join a church. Bless God, you you could go back and find another great church and get connected and grow. We'd love to have you here at Destiny, but watch this. It's not about joining a church. It's about joining the church. It's about joining the head of the church, which is Jesus. And if you want to receive his forgiveness and know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you can be in right standing with God, then I'm going to invite you right now to pray with me. Matter of fact, I'm going to do this. If that's you and you say, that's me, Pastor, I'm in. Put your hand up. Put your hand up. Just put it up. Slide it up. Yeah, okay. Yeah, who else? Who else? Anyone else? Friends, don't look around. Like, I, I, I could have done the head bowed and eyes closed thing. I know people do that in the church, but, you know, because we don't want to embarrass anyone because God knows this is an embarrassing thing. What? No. If you want to do business with God, I think that that just, I, I think, I personally believe that the moment you raise your hand up, you're saved because you're saying, I'm in. I'm in, Lord. Right? Help. Save me. Anyone else? It's filling my heart. It's, I feel it by the Spirit. Someone else. Is there anyone else? And I'm going to pray. Those of you that are watching online, this invitation extends to you as well. I don't care if you're watching this now live or down the road three years or 30 years down the road. If you're hearing this message and you're still able to hear it because you're alive, guess what? Salvation is still made available to you. And I want to just invite everyone right now who says yes to Jesus And saints of God who have prayed this prayer before, join in with me. We're going to all together confess Jesus as Lord. Amen? Pray this out loud. Pray, Lord Jesus, I confess my need for a Savior. I ask you, Jesus, be my Lord. Forgive me of my sin. Help me to turn from it. Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God and that you died on the cross for the sin of the world. Jesus, I believe that you rose from the grave just as your word says. And now I want to live my life to know you and to make you known. In Jesus' name.